Hi there, and welcome to the last Christmas bonus episode of Two Texts. It is almost Christmas, and we're all thinking about presents and stuff like that, so it seems appropriate that today, John and I are talking about the Magi and their gifts for Jesus. So David, we are back. We had a fantastic chat earlier this week about Joseph. Oh, I just love that. And I have to say, I I was, I think the two of us could have kept talking about Joseph for a wee while longer there. That was, (laughs) what a story. And he doesn't say anything. We had a lot to say about him. <laughs> it's, it's true. I was just a bit. You took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, sorry. No, 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 you're okay. It's 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 probably a sign that we are we are sinking almost automatically together. So yes, absolutely. It, he never speaks, but but we did a little bit of speaking on his behalf, and his actions were oh my goodness, just magnificent actions within that. But we're going to try and nudge in a little bit to another part of what's sometimes called the Christmas story, and that's the visit of the Magi and and see what we can pull from that. So so we go from this gorgeous finish at the end of chapter one of Matthew, but uh, he did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. And then it's straight in to this beautiful story of the Magi. So do you want to read that for us and let's see where we go? I do. And, and Magi, this is another one of those those words that I think <laughs> has four letters, and I have heard at least five different ways that people have said it. <laughs> yes, the Maggies. That's would be great. Yes, Absolutely. Yes. I, I remember uh, my, in fact, it was our, we both were, I think we both were taught by, by the same New Testament lecture in our early days. I remember him telling us once, it's a hard G, Latin doesn't have a soft G, and the entire class promptly ignored him and said, we're not going around talking talking about the Maggie. <laughs> so, so Magi is. And, um, so Matthew chapter two and verse one. Yeah, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Of course, this is this is sometimes referred to as the uh, epiphany, isn't it, David? It's this, yes, this sense right. of a moment. I, I actually had a fresh look at the definition of epiphany. A moment of sudden and great revelation or realization. Oh, I love mm. that. Yes. An epiphany. And of course, we we see it, we sort of see a lot of seeing, a lot of moments of realization happening in the story, mm. which is which is absolutely beautiful. But we, last time we talked about the fact that we, we take the different gospel stories and we sort of amalgamate them together. And mm. this is probably one of those stories that suffered from having its chronology uh, <laughs> nudged a little bit. The 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 Magi arriving with the shepherds, etc., which <laughs> yes, which we're true. fairly confident 
And embarrassing the shepherds because their gifts are a little better. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, the shepherds have like not even wrapped anything and these boys are rocking up with serious gold plated gifts. So so it 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 is well it's it is worth it's a story worth sort of pulling out of Mm-hmm. The the sort of nativity scene a little bit just to give us a bit of perspective. Would would that be fair? Just thinking about that. Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a quite a few things that that we do that that creates this. I mean, if you read Matthew and forget the story, right? If you forget everything you saw in your school play, Matthew does give you quite a bit of evidence that that actually this happens a, a, quite a while later, right? quite mm. quite a while later, and even in the traditions of how we. Um, how we celebrate Christmas, actually, if you if you lean into the more traditional ways of, of celebrating Christmas, this is how this, the story is told over a period of time. I get myself on my my high horse here, John, but like I think it's it's almost it helps people sometimes to know this that essentially this sort of there's a period of time of four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve that is known as Advent, right? And and that's it's that period of time from the sort of roughly the end of November, beginning of December, those four Sundays, and then whatever space is left between those four Sundays and then Christmas Eve. And Advent ends at the end of Christmas Eve in the in the classic church calendar then at that point. And that's why, if you remember when we were kids, Advent calendars didn't have a twenty fifth on them, right? True, Advent calendars true. ended on the twenty fourth. Where true. all these all these kids these days get an extra chocolate on the twenty fifth. Right. And so so there's this sense that that the reason that was, in case you wonder when you were a kid, why did we only because that was an advent calendar and it counts down the days the days to the end of Advent and the beginning of Christmas. And in the Christian tradition, and we're going back hundreds of years that this has been celebrated for, Christmas is a 12-day long festival, Mm -hmm. hence the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, Mm -hmm. which a lot of people think is a 12-day countdown to Christmas. But actually, (laughs) here's the funny thing. I hear people all the time time saying these days, oh my goodness, they make make Christmas such a big deal nowadays. It's one day in December. And I always want to say, no, no, Christmas is 12 days long. (laughs) And the 12 days of Christmas start on the 25th Mm -hmm. and end 12 days later on a festival the church knows as Epiphany, the day that we remember the the arrival of of, of, of of these magi. And now, so for me, that's really fascinating because what it allows you to do if you follow that tradition is tell the story as it goes. So you yes. keep this sense of, oh, there's gaps and there's space in time between this. So, I mean, this podcast is not about me defending tradition, <laughs> but, but, but it's about it, it, sometimes you see the reason the traditions are is to help us keep some of the story straight in our mind rather than cramming everybody around the nativity scene. <laughs> now, to be clear, I love nativity scenes of course. because actually what we have to realize when you look at a nativity scene is it's not like a historical snapshot of the moment. It's here are all the characters that were in play and and therefore it reminds us to tell the story to our children, doesn't it? Of course. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of going to uh, visit the Vatican and stood in the Sistine Chapel and looked at the ceiling uh, of Michelangelo's magnificent pictures and uh, paintings, mm-hmm. and you realise, my goodness, he was a magnificent artist, not necessarily a great theologian, um, <laughs> according to some of his representation. And I think the nativity scene, it's sort of, that's what's happened to it over the years. A whole bunch mm-hmm. of stuff has just morphed into the story, and you end up with something well, we all love it. We all go, ooh, oh yeah, absolutely. But technically, it's not really. This is not really what happened. And and uh, you know that, w- without bursting anybody's bubble, it's th- this sort of story helps us to pull that timeline out a little bit. Well, and notice verse that. eleven. Notice verse eleven. Just let me let me say the most controversial thing we'll ever on. say on, on on two texts. But notice verse eleven. They're in a house, a house. Not a stable. <laughs> yes. And if anyone if anyone wants some real outstanding scholarship on that, let, let's take you back to one of our book recommendations a long time yes. ago, Kenneth Bailey, Jesus mm. Through Middle Eastern Eyes. And he will explain in just so many wonderful ways that the whole myth of the inn and the innkeeper, it just it, it's even culturally, it's a bit unusual for that age and that time. And his explanation will help end 
to understand that and connect the dots to verses like this. So that's well worth a look without us turning this into an explanation of the (laughs) difference between uh, a cave and in and the house. So yes. there we are. <laughs> so, so these, so a couple of things I, I spot just in this text, though, John, that, that are really, are really quite interesting. There's, there's, there's one verse three. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Like you know that you're a despot <laughs> when, when you get worried, and everybody else is worried because you're worried. <laughs> Absolutely. As Caesar once said of Herod, safer to be his pig than his son. Yes. He was a bit of a megalomaniac, a man given to extreme behaviour. And of course, we see that some, he he erected magnificent buildings. And then we see him not in the reading that we've had, but as a result of the Magi's sort of redirection away from him, just an act of complete madness and terror, where he kills all the boys under two in the vicinity. Hence Which the also gives us a the... slight insight into potentially the passage of time. Yes. That that they they that they this could be anything up to two years after the birth of Jesus. Yes. Yes. And so in Herod and he's sometimes referred to as Herod the Great, I, I do think that's slight oxymoron, but there we are. It, mm. it, in Herod the Great, you do have someone who has the propensity to protect his power using any means whatsoever. And he is an incredible person. He survives against all the odds. He manages to position himself incredibly with the Romans and creates a seat of power for himself that he doesn't want anybody taken away, especially this king of the Jews. Mm. So so you, you, you've, you've really got a, a huge subtext sort of going on here at the center of the story as well, which of course is really beautiful because it, it. I think you read Jesus then in the midst of political intrigue, religious debate. He is living under the boot of Rome. Jesus isn't exempt from all of these things. He literally, in, in the story following the Magi, he becomes a refugee from his mm. own country, ends up in Egypt to get away from uh, Herod's family and Herod's grasp. So, so immediately in the story, we're thrust into the polarization of the society of Jesus, the vulnerability that the people were under, and the world that Jesus would have grown up in. And and Matthew introduces all of that to us immediately in the story. And that lovely, soft, fluffy postcard scene of of the Christmas nativity suddenly gets a little bit dark around the edges. Mm. Because the visit of the Magi also heralds a threat directly to the life of Jesus as a baby, mm. as a boy. And I think it's it's interesting that you pick up that that whole process of of the displacement of of Jesus, his family, and and that idea of this aligning. In one sense, in Matthew's narrative, it aligns Jesus with Moses, doesn't it? That yeah. that he finds himself paralleling through this journey from Egypt uh, and all of this sort of thing, but. But fascinating, even in the kind of narrative inversion, if that's the way we want to talk about it. We talked in the last episode about how grace is going to define righteousness slightly differently. Interesting that that here Jesus goes to Egypt to escape and stay safe, the very place that normally you would expect you need rescuing from. So there's a subtle commentary almost into how bad things have gotten in Israel Mm -hmm. that go back to Egypt for safety because Israel isn't the safe place anymore. But I do think it's interesting. When you you made those comments, I was thinking about this kind of text within Scripture about how Jesus is tested in every way. And you think, goodness, here we even find Jesus who can align himself with the refugees, the displaced, the marginalized, because his own beginning of his own life. And then, of course, a huge challenge for us, without trying to be overly political, John, but a huge challenge for us is that our views on refugees and immigrants and and all that sort of thing perhaps could be colored by this story because mm. because this is who Jesus was as well. It, it's very, it's got some real depth to it for us to ponder, hasn't it? Well, it has uh, at the heart of what we sometimes call the Christmas story. You have real darkness mm. and tragedy. So we've reflected on Jesus being the light 
that would come into the darkness. The darkness didn't understand it and comprehend it. And we we love to interpret all of that stuff very, very spiritually, a spiritual mm. darkness and spiritual light. But but the light is also shining in a a a season of history that is mm. really dark and vicious and nasty and where human rights and mm. civil rights and even religious rights are being trampled on. And when you have a megalomaniac like Herod, who even the Romans go, Oof, we're not quite sure we like this guy all that much. I mean, when mm. Herod the Great passes away, his son, the, the, the sort of Israel in that sense, it divided amongst his his sons. And one of his sons is so distasteful to the Romans that they remove him and put Pilate in his place. Now, when the Romans are removing you because you're not really that nice, I mean, you are seriously in trouble as far as a sense of humanity is concerned. So so Jesus, the story of Jesus is magnificent. It's filled with hope. It's filled with life. It's filled with light. And yet there is a darkness to it here mm. that the Magi are right at the edge of. They are unmistakably they they inadvertently open up this can of worms in wishing to worship Jesus they in, inevitably put him in danger yes. and they alert Herod to this moment that uh, then creates this terrible knock-on effect of both mm. the destruction of children and the the evacuation of Mary, Joseph and Jesus down to Egypt. So it's very, very dark and it has something to say to us and our attitudes to the darkness in our world and how innocent people are suffering horrifically because of the madness of individuals and people around the world that forced onto the back of trucks and into yeah. boats to try and find a better life. And and there's a... And the story... Actually, I mean, the whole nativity story speaks to some of the stuff that Jesus is going to do in his life, even in, in relation to the conversation we're having. I think about like Luke's story. You don't have Magi in Luke's story. You have shepherds. Shepherds, shepherds, are, shepherds are as close to you get to being outcast from society without mm -hmm. actually being outcast from society. But we, we imagine shepherds. And I think Jesus has rehabilitated the shepherd image. We've said this before in this podcast. Coming, the angels coming to shepherds is a weird move, right? Yeah. Unless you're attempting to communicate that the tables are being turned, that Indeed. the people who were ignored are now, are, are now not to be, you know, are not going to be ignored in this new kingdom. And there's a level of that happening in Matthew chapter two as well. True. Because True. There's definitely this sense that's going on here that, oh, by the way, there's a new king and it's not Herod. So, mm -hmm. so the palace is not the place. And, and it's beautiful, even that image of the, the, the Magi. They see this star. They figure out this means this, this new king is born. So then they kind of just, their, their, their GPS gets them so far. And, and then they basically just head to, <laughs> they, they, they just head to the king. That's probably where it's yeah. going to be. That's probably where we're going to find that out. And so I think there's something really powerful in that sense that where you expect to find the king is not where he is. I, and I feel like, again, Matthew's intentionally n navigating that. I love his connection to the prophetic text in this as well. Chapter two, verse one, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. And then and then Herod says like, well, wait a minute, where's this happening? And the response is in Bethlehem in Judea. Yes. Well, why do we keep saying that? Well, because the prophet's written, hey, you Bethlehem in the land of Judah. <laughs> it's it, There's a beautiful kind of just repetition of of the kind of the prophetic text shaping the story there. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. But yes, yeah, so I think these these characters of, of of Magi provide some really interesting sort of contrast to us to understand how this Jesus story is coming about. And of course, a couple of things, they're not kings. Mm. So unfortunately, it's not it, they're not they're not kings tradition in, in oh. terms of the biblical text. They're they're Magi. Can, can I not sing that Christmas carol anymore? <laughs> well, it's a queen. great song though. It's a great song. So That's maybe a great you should song. sing okay, it anyway. Yeah. And Magi are actually, I mean, I, this is like this could be controversial because they're they're probably closer to astrologers yep. than yep. they are kings and and i am in no way going to recommend that anybody uh, go out and start taking astrology seriously but i find it fascinating there's these little hints all the way through scripture that god occasionally is so total that we find him in unusual and surprising ways don't we um we do. so they're not kings and they may be astrologers 
and we don't know that there's three of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they bring three gifts, but these are pretty weighty gifts, so it's not mm. impossible that they had a little bit of a everybody throw some money in. But it's interesting, that idea of these three kings has has really kind of solidified in our minds in the West. And, and you read the story, and it just I, I felt it was just worth pointing out. Notice that none of that detail is there. <laughs> no, it's done that. And and of course, for, for me, uh, reflecting back, because I just thought about it when you referenced the shepherds in Luke, and of course, mm. what is beautiful here, though these seem to be highly educated and wealthy men on the surface or wealthy people on the surface of it in comparison to the shepherds, what they are, of course, are Gentiles, yeah. whereas the shepherds are more than likely Jewish within that context. So, so you get a get, indeed. So you get this yeah. beautiful not not status reversal, but certainly tension here or, or or juxtaposition here, where you've got you've got intelligent, highly educated Gentiles coming to find Jesus, and you've got marginalized Jewish people on the hillside being invited. To come to Jesus, and there there is something quite beautiful about those ideas being put together for us. That uh, and that the Lord is able to speak to the level of a shepherd and enable them to find the child, mm. and He's able to speak into the world of an astrologer and lead them to the child. Mm. <laughs> I I do like the idea that the Lord is like multilingual that he's he's he can he can do lots of communicating to lots of different people in lots of different ways and we know that ultimately in certainly the, the sort of the Christmas story he wants to mm. communicate Jesus to the world but we must not restrict the Lord in how he communicates to his world and he mm. can he can speak to an astrologer. He can speak to a shepherd. He can speak to every type of person and get their attention. Mm. And and of course, I think that's something really beautiful that's at the heart of the, the 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 Christmas story, as it were. Of course, these astrologers come from the east, but that's it's brilliant how Matthew doesn't even make such a big deal of that. And I wonder, going back to what we talked about in the last episode, the mm. genealogy will. Well, Ruth comes from the yep. east, right? Mm -hmm. So so actually you're seeing again this holistic God is with us, he is saving people, and he's drawing people from all sorts of different places. But is Matthew with his genealogical intro saying, oh, and by the way, this isn't entirely new. Your favorite King David, well, his grandma, she was from there too. <laughs> and, and and maybe even a nudge, a nudge further on that, David, is that, the area they came from would have been an area of the world that historically the Jewish people were exiled into. Mm -hmm. So is it possible? Is it possible that that they took the scriptures with them, that they went to Persia, that they went to Babylon, that these are the areas being represented by these Magi and maybe... Mm -hmm something of the magnificence of the story of uh, God's salvation purposes gets relayed into an exile context and mm. gets picked up in some way or another by these by these magi that that actually this is not a random event they're not just looking at stars in the sky but mm. there's perhaps a connectedness to stories that they have picked up. If these are men that are prepared to listen to all forms of wisdom and mm. imbibe wisdom from all sorts of traditions, then maybe this idea that one will come who will save the world, actually, maybe that, maybe that is also part of that post-exilic legacy. Maybe a stretch too far, but I certainly think it, it's it's something worth considering. I love the notion in Jeremiah twenty nine, where the Israelites, well, the, sorry, the people of, of of God are are told 
to seek the welfare of the place where they are, yeah. to seek the shalom of, of yeah. the, the peace, uh, the wholeness of the place that they are. I love this idea that in the process of doing that, they leave behind their ideas. And so like you say, it, it's, in, it's in the silence, isn't it? But, but somehow these, these magi are expecting something. They, they, they knew it was coming. They've, and of course, like you say, the huge elements of the, the messianic prophetic texts mm. are written by in a displaced context in a they're they're away from home they're in the east somewhere they're they're yeah so no i love i love the i love the possibility of that john i think that's kind of that's kind of exciting yeah it's it's just one of those because because of course they they didn't just deposit and then leave again the, the the evidence shows that not everyone returned after exile that actually jewish communities within the exilic arena thrived yes. continue to thrive within that and and yes. maybe Maybe, maybe, maybe. Out of the horror of the exile comes something of a seed of hope, which these men eventually mm. are the beneficiaries of. So it's just a thought. It's maybe a wild thought, but it's yeah. worth a consideration, I think. I love it. I, I, I think for me, one of the beautiful things, David, is in verse two, it's such a simple thing, really, but it is a striking thing. Mm. And it says, it just says, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star. We saw his star when it rose and have come um, to worship him. And, and of course, we're not quite sure what, what they saw, but there's all sorts of conjectures and theories. But when you think of the size of the universe, the thousands of stars that these men w- would have seen. I, I did a little bit of sort of research on this and, and they, they, they reckon that the naked eye can see approximately 5,000 stars on a clear night. So if you've got mm. no light pollution and it's no clouds and you look up, you're just the cast of your eye if you can see approximately 5,000 stars are in your eye wow. gate with that, which is an incredible idea. Mm. In, in our in our galaxy, the Milky Way, there's an estimated 200 billion stars. <laughs> so we're not seeing okay. many of them. There's apparently... Uh, and I don't know how they work this out, but greater brains than me will explain this. But they estimate there's a hundred billion galaxies, right? Wow. And now, if my math is right, that's like twenty thousand billion stars mm. in the known universe. Okay. Mm. Now, what? However, these these wonderful men saw the stars. They saw something extraordinary. Mm. They saw something. Different. They saw something that stood mm. out. Now I know we've had movies and and all sorts of attempts creatively and artistically to sort of portray that, but it must have been something uh, that caught their attention in the midst of a universe of twenty thousand billion stars to see that star. And 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 I know we we can't sort of go beyond. But I love their language. They didn't just say, we saw a star, but they said, we saw his star. Mm. I, I love that. Uh, and it, is is that, that's part of their epiphany moment? I, I don't know. It's, but, but for me, again, the Lord gets their attention through something they understand and, and draws them, draws them forth. I love that. And then there is a, a connection back. In fact, I think you'll you'll often see that if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, it actually takes you right back to the the prophecy of of Balaam, doesn't it? In Numbers twenty four, this idea of a star that comes out of Jacob and a scepter yep. that rises out of out of Israel. So there's there's connections again that that this you've got this idea of why have these Magi been looking for a star, even well, yeah. what what has been, and, and this sense that well, actually, if you're rooted in the text of Torah, that's not a completely far out idea that something mm. Mm. in the heavens will will point us towards the right way. It's beautiful, and 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 I love. There's a beautiful one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 19, verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. It's part of my morning confessions when I'm reading the Bible. But the psalm begins in this most magnificent way. Listen to these words, David. The heavens declare the glory of God. Mm. The skies proclaim 
the works of his hands. Day after day they f- pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard mm. from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, I, I'm going to use a bit of poetic license here. But I love the thought that not only do we understand this generically, that we can stand in our street or our back garden and look up and hear their voice, the voice of the stars as it goes out into all the earth. But but I love the idea poetically, I hope I'm not overcooking the text, that this star called to them, this star spoke to them, not, not in words, mm. But this star speaks to them. It draws them. This star Mm. of Jacob is calling to these Gentiles. And here you have these Gentile men so aware that something extraordinary is going to happen. Mm. That when a star starts to speak to them, that they are prepared to literally travel hundreds of miles, possibly even thousands of miles. Uh, to mm. get, to, I mean, it's it's a when you think about it, they're they're leaving their homes, they're leaving their livelihood, they're leaving safety, they're venturing into strange territory. They are men on a mission, and they're so consumed by the star speaking to them that they're prepared to travel, in relative terms, halfway across the earth mm. in order to find where this star is landing. It's, it's a magnificent idea that hungry, these men were hungry. These men were searching. They, we, we, we've alluded to John, haven't we? His, the, he came to his own and they didn't recognize him. Here's, mm. here's men that are recognizing him or recognizing something that, that, and yet they're not, they're not his own. It's just, I think it's a beautiful, and especially that coming from Matthew. I would expect the Magi story to be in Luke. Gentiles rocking up with gifts, spotting Jesus. I, But to see Matthew include the idea of the Magi, the Gentiles turning up because of his star. I think it's mm. a beautiful, beautiful idea. When you were talking about all of the galaxies in that, it, it, ironically or unsurprisingly, perhaps it was it was Psalm nineteen one that came to my mind when you were talking there as well. And this might just be right. evidence that you and I spend too much time talking to each other. That, <laughs> that because because funnily enough, like you talked about how important Psalm nineteen is to your kind of daily uh, sort of readings. In that, for me, Psalm nineteen fourteen is 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 a daily meditation for you. May these words of my mouth. And this yes. meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my yes. rock and my redeemer. I, I talk for a living, right? And uh, my vocation is, is is all in that. And so I find myself trying to pray that daily to say, okay, I've I've got a whole host of things I could say today. <laughs> they may not yes. all be pleasing, right? So, yes. so, but, but I tell you what's interesting on in Psalm 19, when I was listening to you talk about it right there, you've got this, this world, this surrounding culture where the worship of the of the creation is very high worshiping right. the sun god you mm. you track it from all of the egyptians the the romans the greeks the the god of the sun is the great god he's the mm. he's the one really in all of it and it's fascinating to me how psalm 19 in a world surrounded by worship of the sun and all of the celestial beings including yes. other aspects of creation this psalmist positions the sun under the control of of Yahweh. Yeah. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Right? It's beautiful. So, so why I think that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning poetry, but it offers a contrast mm. to the surrounding beliefs and cultures of the world. Right? So again, this is a theme we see all the way through Scripture. The shepherds are the ones first invited. Now the people from the east are coming to find the king, not the king himself. Uh, yes. well, this is rooted in the biblical tradition to, to just be awkward, to actually mm. to, to not mm. fit in with your surrounding culture very well. Everybody else worships the sun god, and then you yep. get these annoying little nation that's bugging all of the other nations around about them. They worship mm. this god called Yahweh, and they don't like our gods and and yet, not only did they worship Yahweh and not like our gods, they tell us that the things we believe are gods are actually just put into place by their God. Now, yes. so, so therefore then, what the psalmists do 
is the having now decided where the sun fits in the whole process, they decide. And I think this is what you see it here. Look at it. So, so let's talk about what the sun does. Well, God gave it a tent. And it comes out of its chamber and it goes out one side of the world, round the other side of the world, warms everything up, does its circuit. And then we're told the law of the Lord is perfect. Right? So the, 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 the sun follows the law of the Lord. Indeed. The sun points us to Yahweh. Right? Mm-hmm. So again, maybe I'm stretching it here a little bit, but that's exactly what we're seeing happening with this Magi story then. Mm. Right? That, that it's actually... They may be astrologers. They may look, and this is perhaps the big problem with astrology, is it assumes that the stars will give me the guidance I need for my life. What these magi do is they realize the stars will guide us to the one who will give us the guidance. And and that's a very subtle but but deeply biblical difference (laughs) that I think is is there that I think is quite stunning to to just wrestle in a little bit. And, of course, it's reflected in the creation story itself, David, isn't it, Where, Mm. where God... In the opening, his opening statement, let there be light, but the sun and the moon aren't created until day four in the creation story. So the light of the universe isn't coming from the sun. <laughs> it's just like in Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you, you get the glory of the Lord is its light in the New Jerusalem mm. and the Lamb is its, is its lamp. It's it's. Mm. So you, you are getting deep ideas here that... And of course, the Torah itself expresses it forbids the worship of the stars because the Mm. stars themselves are pointing to the Lord. Do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping Mm. things, Davrim says or Deuteronomy says. So so we, we are directed away from the stars as a point of worship, but directed towards the God who made the stars. Let there be light. And then not just the next day, but. But three days later, on the fourth day, God gets around to making the sun mm-hmm. it's, and, and creating the tent for the sun. It's just, it's just absolutely magnificent. And I think in the Magi story, we get this perfect circle completion. So I, I saw beautiful symmetry in the story, David. I don't know if you've witnessed this before, but it says they saw the star and then it says they followed it. So so there's a sense in which they've seen the star, his star, and they're following the star. And then later on in the text, it says this in verses 10 to 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child and they bowed down and worshipped him. So they followed the star, but worshipped him. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the illusion you related to in Psalm 19. Yes. And like our our viewers will or our listeners will think we've we've sort of planned all this and made all this up. This has literally come together in our podcast mm-hmm. together that that actually the Magi pulled together something of the creation motif. They pulled together the idea that the sun in Psalm 19 follows the law, and in fact the sun has no existence without God's Torah, as it were, God's truth. And then we have the Magi here following the star, his star. But when they saw him, they bowed down and worshipped him. They didn't worship the star. Yes. <laughs> they worshipped the one who created the star. And mm. I love that. I am so, I mean, that for me is the epiphany moment. Yeah. Mm. Follow stars, but bow down and worship him. And mm. I think that's the proper order that we should yeah. always understand it in. Yeah, no, John, I'm so happy that you unpacked that because that's exactly what I was feeling forming as we were chatting through this. It was just that that, that Matthew, because I was even looking at his precision of that sentence a little earlier on when we were talking, and it's very deep, it's very precise. They, they came to the house, they saw the child, Mary was there. But then he's even at pains, not to go back into the previous set of podcasts we, we, we did, but he's even at pains to point out that it's Jesus that they worshipped. Mm. Mary is there, but Jesus is the one that they're worshipping. It's, it's, it's very much, he, he clarifies all of this. So yeah, and I, and I just think that's, I can't help but think Matthew's riffing on all of that. I, I can't help Absolutely. but think that this is, this is what he's rooted in and he's pointing out this story of these Eastern Magi coming and finding the true king. It's yeah. the, the, the anointed one, which of course what this Messiah means, isn't it? The one who is mm. anointed to be the king. And so they give mm. him, they, they, they open their treasuries and, and give him these beautiful gifts. It's just, 
it, it's a stunning moment. That's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And is that striking again that just as Joseph, we we get the sort of the four dream so, uh, sequence with mm-hmm. Joseph. These guys are warned in a dream that 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 dream mm-hmm. motif and 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 flow is very very evident. Just as in in Luke, we get the sort of impact of the life of the spirit moving uh, as as an agent in that side of the story we get these magnificent sort of dream encounters that they have and it's a way of god speaking to them and and sort of directing them in that david is it is it worth as we sort of probably draw this this podcast to a close is it worth us saying anything about the gifts of the magi the gold I'm... the frankincense the myrrh well, yeah, I, I think it. I think it is. There's because there's stuff to say there. I mean, <laughs> they opened their treasuries. I I had never noticed this before, John, until I was prepping for for this uh, podcast. But the the Greek word for treasuries uh, for their treasury boxes is is thesaurus. <laughs> oh wow, there I, we are. Come yeah, on. which I'd never really never kind of it. engaged that. That's what a thesaurus is—a treasury of words. But so, given that it's a treasury of words, and we have things to say, we we should. So yeah, unpack. Because there's a few little moments around those three gifts that I think are, are significant, aren't they? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, I think the three gifts have led into the idea that there are there are three sort of people there, yes. which may may in fact affirm that idea. So it's nothing that we would want to fall out on. But of course, they isn't it interesting? The three gifts are distinct. Mm-hmm. They are unique. There's no crossover. It there does feel like an intentionality in these gifts. That, the, that, that these travellers, these magi, thought about what they were bringing before they actually brought them. And, and I do sort of love this idea that, that, that maybe, I suppose in some ways, the gold speaks of kingship, this, this idea that he is the king of the Jews. And they bring gold to honour a, a king. Would that be a fair idea to think about I within think so, that? Yeah, I think so. And then, of course, you've got the sort of the frankincense, which was often sort of an incense permitted in the altar of worship. You can you can find that in Shabbat and Exodus within that. So there, there's a sense of of worship being offered. And of course, the mayor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, my Irish accent, but the mayor often relates to the this part of the spices that are connected to the burial of an individual yes. as well. So you get this. This gold, maybe relating to his kingship, this frankincense, uh, a life of worship, a sweet smelling savour, aroma being offered up to God. And then you've got Mer perhaps pointing to something else. Now, I don't want to overcook those, but but of course, I, I love the idea that when the Bible gives us that level of detail, you think, is there something in that detail that we should be paying attention to? And I think I think those gifts may not only be gifts for the moment, but they may also speak prophetically into the life and ministry mm-hmm. of Jesus. And of course, at a practical level, it, they may also have helped the family survive. I mean, if yes. you're going to run off to Egypt, of course, for two years, well, uh, for a while, we don't you know ex- exactly how long, <laughs> but if you're going to be a refugee in Egypt, you're going to need some collateral. Joseph yes. may have got some work, but but they're going to need something. And certainly we know that Mary and Joseph offered the poor offering at the temple when they brought Jesus to the temple. So so the the sort of the wealth that potentially could be within these gifts may have helped the family in their early struggles to survive those early struggles as well. A couple of just cross references to add there that may interest people in that sense. Of course frankincense as well is becomes in Jewish tradition an, an incense that that without going into too much detail is but an incense that becomes symbolic of the divine name. So you see that particular incense burnt in uh, in a couple of contexts. So which I think is 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 interesting that they bring an incense to to, to mm. Jesus. I, I think that's yeah. curious. But what really interests me is this this tradition in, that that Jewish um, uh, people would give wine mixed with myrrh to people who are being crucified to try and essentially 
or just getting very beer. drunk so that they're not yeah, kind yeah. of on board with what's we're not aware really of what's happening so so it's interesting that Mur definitely pushes to the fun these funeral traditions but also potentially there's a little bit of a reference to a crucifixion tradition mm -hmm. as well it's, it might be hanging around there you can't make too much of that and then, and then the final just cross reference, of course, is that in the what do you call it the the holy anointing oil in Exodus thirty, there's myrrh in there as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a few places if you just do a little bit of cross referencing, you can see okay, you know exactly as you were saying, John, all of these gifts have prophetic depth to them potentially, and it's hard to put your finger on. Well, it definitely points to exactly this, but there's yes. a lot of resonances there, aren't there? There are. There are. And, and again, if these, I, I suppose it points, I, I suppose what I'm trying to lean into there is if these men were looking for the star, mm. if there was something in their world that was suggesting something's coming and they're looking and they're prepared to travel halfway around the world and they're prepared to bring intentionally and deliberately the sort of gifts they bring, then these aren't random gifts. Mm. There's, yes. there's something even in their gifts that speaks to their understanding mm -hmm. of who Jesus is, which is potentially quite remarkable. If these are not simply, oh, let's take some gold, or that's it. But if these are gifts representative of the understanding of these travelers, these magi, it is mm -hmm. quite remarkable. And maybe rightly, it's called the epiphany, you know, rightly it, it's, it's handed to these men because, mm. because they see something, they understand something, they've grasped something so significant about who Jesus is that they're prepared to travel so far at their own expense and bring such expensive gifts and then bow down and worship Jesus. It's the first, as far as I can see in Matthew, David, and I could be wrong, but as far as I can see in Matthew, it is the first Gentile act of worship mm. to Jesus. And I, I'm moved by that. I love, I love that. Yes. I, I love I love this. That And this must have blown Joseph's mind and Mary's mind as these travellers got off whatever beast they were travelling on, dusted themselves down and bowed mm. down to the child. Yeah. And I think symbolically, those magi represent every Gentile on earth. They, mm. That those who are far away can see his star, that those who yeah. are searching can find, and that those who are looking for the life of God that is contained within Jesus the Messiah can also bow down and worship and see for themselves that he is the king. So I, I, I love their story. Yeah. And I love the fact that it's part of our journey. And all of this whole story then transpires. Eventually Herod dies, but his, basically, his son ends up in charge. And so as a result, when the, when the family do return, they decide to set up camp yeah. in this little place called Nazareth. Nazareth. <laughs> the perfect hiding place. Yeah. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, they say. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of our episode today. We hope that you've really enjoyed listening to these bonus episodes for Christmas. We hope that they've helped you just immerse yourself into this story of Christmas a little bit more. We'll be back in the new year on the 10th of January, continuing our Acts series. But until then, have a Merry Christmas from us. <laughs>